Hello, welcome to the World of Optometry webinar series. We're just waiting one or two more minutes just for some latecomers to arrive. We found that the last presentation, we do tend to get quite an influx arriving two, three, four minutes after the webinar. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Lorcan, I'm an optometrist and I'll be your host today. I'll be joined by my colleague, Laura, in the background, and Laura is going to be helping you with any technical issues, such as difficulty with sound, difficulty with picture, etc. We have a wonderful presentation today. Just before we talk about the presentation, I'd like to go through some housekeeping rules. So I'd like you to have your cameras off and your mics off. Hopefully you should be able to know how to do that. If you do have any difficulties, don't be afraid to ask that question in the chat box function down towards the bottom. Please try to keep your microphones off at all times. This tends to minimize the amount of background noise to other attendees and also to the guest speaker too as well. We'd also like you to rename your electronic device that you're watching this webinar from and please match it to the name you registered for the webinar for. This is very important to receive your certificate of attendance today. If you don't know how to rename your electronic device, again, please don't hesitate to contact my colleague Laura in the chat box function and she will explain to you how we can do that. We would like to ask you to submit any questions in today's webinar, and you can do that at any time through the chat box function tour at the bottom. The questions will be asked at the end of the webinar by our guest speaker. So if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. If you have any questions with regard to obtaining your certificate of attendance today, again, please don't hesitate to contact Laura in the background, and please submit your questions addressed to everybody. So Laura will be able to address any questions you have with regard to the certificate of attendance or any issues with technicalities such as sound and picture. To receive your certificate of attendance today, you must attend for approximately 40 minutes of the 60 minute presentation. We'll also be sending you out an email survey at the end of the presentation. I will ask you to answer those questions to get your certificate of attendance. So today's presentation will be approximately 35 to 45 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session. We're delighted to have a wonderful speaker with us today called Mr. Drew Thompson. Drew is an optometrist in the United Kingdom and also Drew is a contact lens consultant. Drew works in both private practice and hospital practice and he fits contact lenses for people with keratoconus and also common ears. Drew is a fellow of the British Contact Lens Association and has delivered this uh, webinar at an optical conference. So we're delighted to have Drew and without any further attention or further ado, I'd like you to pass over to Drew for your presentation, please. Sorry, Drew, you just might need to unmute. Can't hear you. There we go, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect, Drew, thank you very much. Thanks, Lorcan. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm, as uh, Lorcan said, I'm a, an optometrist in the UK, the north of England, um, and I do work both within the, the NHS hospital system and also in, in private practice. Um, I'll move along. Let me just share my, my screen so we can start. We've done this already, haven't we? But there we go. So can everybody see that now? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, so this talk today is about um, what do you do with those complicated cases, uh, particularly uh, corneal uh, disease, um, and how do we rehabilitate those uh, in, in any way we possibly can? Um, I'm quite a proponent of um, delaying surgery as, as long as possible. Uh, we've had some really quite good results without having to use uh, the knife. So uh, carry on and I'll start this if I can. I've just put this picture up quickly because uh, just to give you an insight of where we are, this is, this is in the Lytham where I live in the north of England near a place called Blackpool. Um, that was taken on a particularly nice day. We don't get many of those. Um, but anyway, we'll carry on. So, uh, a few declarations. I'm an independent contact lens consultant. Uh, I have had uh, contracts before with m manufacturers. I don't at the moment, and I have no particular um, financial benefit from recommending any particular contact lens. 
So um, in this this sort of presentation, I, I've tried to sort of discuss my uh, sort of take on on how to rehabilitate people's vision, particularly with, with disease, corneal disease. In the UK, I don't know about the rest of the world, I presume the rest of the world, but in the UK, there's a, a big uh, trend to pres prescribe rigid gas permeable lenses, small lenses. Um, the vast majority of people uh, with corneal disease will have these lenses prescribed at the hospital. I, I tend to find that they're not always the best option. And, and this is a video I took to try and sort of um, demonstrate that. As we can see, this, this lens was a, a, a chap, this chap had not a lot of problems with his lenses. His vision was quite good. But as you can see, it's very, very mobile because these lenses very rarely fit the, the eye well. You can see the lens moving quite a lot and you can actually see bubbles forming under the lens just here, if you look down at the bottom there, you can see a bubble there. So it, it's quite obvious that these lenses quite often really have a poor fit. And that might not be the, the fitter originally. There was a problem with the, the fitting of the lens. It may well be that this lens is very old, the, the cornea has changed in shape, or even the lens has changed the corneal shape during wear. So if I can move along, there we go. So what will we do? Um, so the visual rehabilitation of the complex cornea, um, we're trying to get the vision as best as possible, we're avoiding uh, complex and risky surgical, option, surgical options. Um, we might have patients with refractive amblyopia um, or anisometropia, difference in prescription between the two eyes. Um, we might have intractable diplopia, so we might have somebody with, with double vision they can't control. And we might have somebody with exposure keratopathy, so severe dry eyes. Some of these lenses can be really, really quite effective um, for dry eye patients. Uh, and then we might have a cosmesis, so we might have somebody that's um, got a dis disfigured eye and they're quite conscious of it. We might be able to help them with that. So what is a complex cornea? Um, I'm, I'm talking about this very much from a UK perspective, but the, the vast majority of the patients I, I see with complicated corneas will be those with keratoconus. I know that's very um, different throughout the world. Everybody has different incidences of this. Um, we have, currently in the UK, I think there's about one in 4,000 with keratoconus. Um, there, there, there are hotspots throughout the world. Um, mainly, uh, there's a large population in sort of um, Northern Asia, India, Pakistan around there. Um, there's a hotspot in New Zealand, there's one in Denmark, um, but it, it is prevalent throughout the world, but more so in, in different places. We might have a post-surgical cornea. Now these are, can be one of the most difficult fittings of, of a contact lens because it's a man-made surface. So we have a patient with a graft, for instance, so that the surface of the eye can be really quite complicated and complex. Um, we might have a traumatic eye, so somebody with an injury, um, I had a patient the other day who'd had a, an arrow in the, a toy arrow in their eye, which had caused a penetrating uh, injury, uh, and, and that they can be difficult to fit as well for other reasons. Um, we might have high amotropy, so we might have a child with a with a high uh, prescription of you know minus ten and above, or even the, the other way, hyperopic, high hyperopia, and we obviously want the, those patients to develop their their. their um, the binocular systems as, as best as best we can, so it might be best to fit a contact lens to keep the image on the retina as as, as similar between the two eyes as possible. Uh, we might have um, astigmatism, so a patient with high astigmatism. Okay, so keratoconus, which is the biggest category of patients I see, um, you can see on the left here. This is a, a typical shape of a of a cornea that I, I fit contact lenses to. I find this this method of fitting lenses and visualizing the cornea really quite uh, quite good for me. I often will look at the profile of a cornea. It gives you a good indication of, of how steep the lens you, you eventually give the patient needs to be. Um, you can look at topography uh, till, till the cows come home, but um, it doesn't give you as good a visualization as just looking at the profile of the lens. And you can do uh, the cornea and you can do this on a slit lamp quite easily and turn the the, uh, the 
magnification system as, as close to 90 degrees perpendicular to the cornea as, as you can. And you can get a good indication of, of how steep that, that cornea is. So what is uh, keratoconus? It's actually part of a group of conditions called ectasias. Um, and ectasia is basically a weakness of the corneal tissue and it creates higher order aberrations, uh, irregular astigmatism. Keratoconus forms uh, the majority of a group of cases, um, the others being pellucid marginal degeneration, uh, keratoglobus, and uh, you have post-surgical post ectasia, people that have had LASIK surgery where the, the cornea has been thinned too much and therefore you get a, a, an irregular shape in the cornea. And then the, the, the least uh, prevalent condition, which is Terrian's marginal degeneration. I've got a photograph of that later if you don't know what that is. Um, so, as I said before, I, I really do, I'm a proponent of you know, profile photography, so looking at the cornea in profile, but also thin beam optic sections uh, on your slip lab can be a real um, help in visualizing what these corneas are doing. So, if you get as thin a beam as possible, uh, and take a look at the, the, the corneal section. And you'll get quite good at uh, understanding thickness. So obviously, if we've got a normal thickness cornea, that's around about 500 microns in, in thickness. You can then start to judge the depth of tears behind the contact lens quite easily by judging how thick that the tear layer is compared to the cornea. So if you get good at, at looking at the profile of, of uh, sorry, the sections of the cornea, you can start to judge the thickness of, of all the anatomy that you're looking at. And you can see in this photograph here, we've got, uh, this is actually a picture of a pellucid marginal degeneration patient. And you can see that it's very, very thin at the bottom there. So we've got approximately 500 microns centrally, and then you're going down to probably less than 100 at the bottom there. So it gives you a good idea of, of how thick the cornea is and where the weaknesses are. Okay. So the definition of keratoconus, as far as we work to in my hospital clinic, is that uh, there's a difference in, in curvature of over two diopters within the central two millimeters uh, of the, the topography. And you can see that here on, on this, this topography image. The numbers there are in diopters, sorry, in millimeters. Um, and you can see there that there's a big difference between the, the, the two central millimeter points there, two millimeter points. So we also look at the K-max. So the K-max is the steepest curvature on the cornea. And if we have a, a, a reading of over 46 diopters, that's highly indicative of corneal ectasia, that being keratoconus. Uh, we might have a pachymetry of less than 500 microns. Um, essentially, keratoconus and ectasia is a thinning of the cornea. Um, it ob obviously causes steepening, and it's usually inferior nasally. We have striae. They, they will appear in keratoconus. So think of these as stress marks, and I'll come to that in just a second. We often have prominent nerve fibers with keratoconus. So if you see a, a, a younger patient with, with prominent nerve fibers uh, it, in the cornea um, and they've got other um, risk factors such as um, they're atopic, so they're allergic, and they rub their eyes a lot, then I would be highly suspicious of keratoconus developing. We might have a Fleischer ring, which is a, an iron ring which would uh, which is deposited around the base of the, the sort of ectasia. And you'll see that if you put a, a cobalt blue light on your uh, slit lamp and then have a look at the cornea, you'll see a very faint dark line. Um, and that tends to only really occur in quite moderate cases. So there's probably other signs as well. And then Munson sign. Um, I don't know whether everybody knows about Munson sign, but you basically get the patient to look down, lift their eyelids up, and then you can see that the eyelid has been displaced in a, in a conical shape. And obviously that usually is only present when the disease is quite prominent. So there'll be other signs of, uh, to show you that this patient has a keratoconic cornea. They're typically diagnosed in the mid to late teens. 
So Shree, I, the way I describe keratoconus to the patient and the, the parents or the carers or their family, uh, because they quite often don't really understand the condition. They just can't understand why people can't have, just have glasses to see properly. This is a decorative piece of glass that's available in the UK. I don't know whether uh, this is, is common around the world, but we call this bullseye glass. And it's, it's usually in older buildings, but I quite often tell them that's exactly what, um, or very similar to what a keratoconic cornea sees. So you can see the world, it's just extremely distorted. So I made these glasses uh, as a way of, of um, trying to explain to people what, you know, the family members, what, what their son or their, their brother sees. And as you can see, uh, basically all I did was I heated a lens up and pushed a, 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 a pen through the, um, through the plastic. I don't know what's going on the screen here. Um, this is the lens, uh, the same lens, a photograph of it straight on, and you can see all these little stress marks in the centre of the lens. That's where I pushed, pushed the lens through, uh, pushed the, 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 I think it's a pen I pushed into the uh, heated lens. And you can see that, that looks very, very similar to a keratoconic cornea, which is on the left of the screen here. You can see it's virtually exactly the same. I was quite surprised when, when I did that, find out. So stress, stress A is basically stress mark. So these are some of the corneas that I've, I've fitted lenses to. Um, these are some of the conditions that we've seen. So top left there, we've got PMD, that's pellucid marginal degeneration. And this is typically explained to be like a, a pregnant lady's belly. So you can see there at the bottom, you've got this bulging, um, which can be really quite difficult to fit a lens to. You've got keratoglobus as well, which is a, a very similar condition, but the cornea is much larger and bigger, and it thins out more uniformly, but can bulge in, in, in a bigger, in, in a, on, over a, a much wider area. You've got the post-surgical lens and you can uh, cornea, and you can see on that one, if you compare it to the, the other two at the top, it's much flatter centrally. So you've got this the steepening occurs in the periphery and it's flatter in the center of the, of the cornea. And this is a picture of Terrian's marginal degeneration, which is quite rare, certainly in the UK. Um, and you get this thinning um, almost circumferentially. So all the way around the cornea, you, you'll get a thinning and deposits of, of this calcific. Uh, material. So uh, PMD, these are uh, these are typical topography uh, maps of these conditions. So you've got the PMD up the top there. That's quite typical of a PMD. You get the crab claw, or some people call it the kissing bird. So this is formed by a thinning of the cornea inferiorly, which is why you get that, that lower bulge in the cornea. Then you've got keratoglobus. Um, but generally, uh, it, as you can see there, it's, it's, a, it's a much uh, sort of broader area of thinning all over the cornea. Um, your post-surgical tends to be a lot flatter in the center. So you've got this steepening at the bottom, but the center of the cornea is quite flat. You can see it by that blue area there. And then terrians, again, it's this peripheral um, sort of generalized thinning. So you can get steepening all the way around really, but on this particular case, the, the subpocal map wasn't quite as uh, extensive as I'd like it to be. Um, so what's the differences between the two conditions? Well, generally the, the thinning and steepening of the central cornea. Um, when we're fitting these lenses, as I said before, a lot of play, a lot of practitioners in the UK will use RGP lenses and, and they do this. Um, the, the lenses are quite small, so they, they tend to be really quite steep lenses because they have to have, change the curvature quite rapidly um, because we've got to, to fit quite a, a number of different curvatures on the cornea in a small area. Um, the lenses tend to center over the, 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 the apex of the keratoconus, so where the, where the, the cornea is steepest. So that usually tends to be inferiorly uh, so the lenses will tend to drop a lot. And if that video I showed at the start, the lens was quite mobile and it, was, it, it tends to center at the bottom, towards the bottom of the cornea where the steepening is. 
with an RGP lens, you get this excessive movement and that can lead to poor comfort, comfort of the patient. Um, I tend to find with, with patients that I see that have RGP lenses, they will often tell you that the lenses are comfortable, but I will be mindful of that because in a lot of cases, certainly in the UK, um, these people can only really see with their contact lenses in. They have no glasses that work and um, they are quite often quite um, protective of the lenses. They don't want the practitioner to say you can't wear these lenses anymore. So they will tell you that they're comfortable when they actually are not. So you've got to be really sort of careful of, of the patient that comes in and says there's no problems with my eyes because there might be, they just might not be telling you. Uh, the lenses can pop out quite easily um, and that can be an issue for some of these patients. So with PMD, we've got this inferior limbal thinning and we get this steepening, as I said before, the clab core, clab core um, topography there. Um, this is a condition I think that's underdiagnosed in the UK. A lot of it can be diagnosed as, as very low, um, a low cone, so keratoconus that's very, very near the limbus, but actually it can it can be PMD. And that's a that's a um, an important distinction because Typically with keratoconus, um, the, the condition is diagnosed in the early to late teens and generally stops getting worse by natural cross-linking at about the age of 30. Whereas PMD is the opposite almost. It, it's usually diagnosed in later life and gets worse with time. So it's quite important to sort of distinguish between the two because one of them you can sit back and relax thinking after the age of 30, this is probably not going to get any worse. Whereas with a PND patient, it probably will get worse. So it's, that's quite an important distinction. So be careful with, with, with those diagnoses. There are people that can be diagnosed with mixed ectasia. So you can have keratoconus and PND, and, and they can be quite difficult to, to, to handle. Um, so with PND, um, we get this pregnant belly appearance, and the lens Again, it drops over the steepest part of the cornea, and that tends to be very low, but near the limbus. So you do get RGP lenses do drop quite a lot, which means that the the patient tends to see out of the periphery of, of an RGP lens, particularly, and that can can cause glare and problems from the carrier curves that you have on an RGP lens. So with a keratoglobus patient, they tend to be large cornea, well, they are large corneas and the, the, the uh, steepening and the irregularity can occur over a wider area. And, and the same with, an, uh, with a terians really, because you've got this, this peripheral uh, degeneration. Post-surgical uh, corneas can be really varied. Um, they're, never, they're, not, they're not uniform um, because you know, it's a man-made, cornea, well, man-made shape cornea. Um, so you, you can get very, very different results. So some can be steep, but the, most of them tend to be very flat centrally, and that brings its own problems. So this is a post-surgical cornea in OCT. So you can see there um, that the curvature changed quite significantly. If you, if you were to carry the curve on of the host cornea, which you can see quite clearly on the left-hand side, um, the grafted area, you can see there's a vertical line in the cornea, everything beyond that's a graph. If you continue that curve over, it would be a lot steeper than is actually there. So um, I, I have described, I have tried to, to, to um, show people that the reason why we would fit or I would fit a larger lens on a, on a post graft patient by using this image of, this is Table Mountain, South Africa. Um, and he, this represents or in my head, it represents a post-surgical cornea because we've got very flat top there. So if we put, um, if we think of the limbus as here in the, in the foothills, if you pop an RGP lens on there, um, you can see that we've got this very, very deep area above the top of the mountain there, so between the lens and the cornea itself, um, even though we've got quite a nice fit at the, at the mid periphery. So if we were to remove that RGP lens and put on a larger mini scleral lens, or uh, we can 
do this reverse ge uh, curve geometry and we can get it, even though there's, there's still a bit of pooling there, it's a lot less and therefore the patient can get better vision uh, with less movement. So traumatic eye can be, oops, sorry, let me go back. A traumatic eye can be anything really. Uh, and that's when it, you, you earn your money and you really try uh, as hard as you can to get that, that vision better. So when, when do we think an RGP isn't working? Well, these are, are topographies, uh, courtesy of number seven, uh, contact lens, which is um, an RGP hard gas thermal lens manufacturer in the UK. So these are all uh, various different types of, of corneal topography. Um, some uh, post-surgical, there's a PMD there at the top in the middle. Uh, you've got some superior cone keratoconics down there at the bottom left. Uh, you've got a post-surgical bottom right. Um, you've got things of terrians uh, at three o'clock. Um, but these are all images of the contact lenses on those topographies. So you can see the massive difference in all of them. And quite clearly, you can see that, that some of them really don't fit very well, particularly the one at, at nine o'clock here. You can see there's some limbal, uh, sorry, not limbal, peripheral uh, fluting. Uh, where the lens is lifting off the cornea and letting air underneath the lens, same at the one at 12 o'clock. Um, some of them are a, a very heavy central touch with mid peripheral pooling. So these lenses, is, although the, the patient will probably see reasonably well out of them, um, they're not the most ideal of fit. And in, in all these cases, the lenses were fit as, as adequately as, as the, the practitioners could. So um, we also look at, 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 you know, you can talk to the patient and as I've said before, be very careful when you speak to these patients because they are, they are very protective over the lenses. So sometimes the patient, you know, may not feel that the, the lenses are comfortable, but they will tell you that they are. Um, and you've really got to sort of drill down to them, you know, how are you? Are you managing with your lenses? Um, What happens next? What happens when an RGP doesn't work? Do we go straight into surgery? Well, I'm a proponent of, of not doing. I think that surgery really should be the last port of call because of its um, uh, complications and also it, 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 the um, recovery time. I mean, these, ten, these patients tend to be quite young. Um, the, start, the start of the careers, they might have exams, we don't really need to be going through quite complicated surgery at that time in the life. Uh, it's also quite costly. Um, obviously, here in the UK, that's not so much of an issue for the patient because they don't pay this this money. But you know, it, 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 this was written a few a few years ago, so I'm sure that price has, has rocketed recently. But it's five thousand pounds plus for a cornea graft plus the lengthy rehabilitation and obviously the risks involved with that surgery. So are there any other options? Well, yes, there is. <clears throat> In every case, I tend to talk to the patient and, and ask them how they're doing, how they're managing, you know, what could be made better, what, how old are they, what's their occupation, and what are their needs for lenses. Often I'm send, sent patients from, from the hospital clinic who have keratoconus or some ectasia, which tends to be much worse in one eye than the other. Um, and they can come and, and sit in my chair and there'll be 6-6 binocularly or 20-20 binocularly, but one eye is poor. Now, with the kind of lenses that this patient will need, they're quite labor intensive in terms of uh, difficult to get in, out, in and out. They can have issues during the day with wear. And they have much less of an incentive to wear these lenses because the vision out of one eye is very good. So we do tend to have a, a long chat to say, do you really want lenses? Do you need them? If, you, if you've got one good eye, it, it would be nice to have good vision out of two eyes, but do you think that you'd wear it? You probably wouldn't. So we do tend to have a long discussion about what the patient needs and wants from contact lenses. So in the UK, it tends to be that, that people that are diagnosed with, with ectasia or 
or problems with the cornea that this automatically uh, told they need RGP lenses. Uh, and that's not really my sort of thinking. I, I obviously, I, I want the, the best for the patient. And sometimes the best for the patient might not be a, a rigid lens at all. It might be a soft lens. <clears throat> so um, if we move on to soft lenses, um, in the, uh, it's always worth doing a, a, a spectacle refraction to see to see what um, what the patient gets. Don't be obsessed with getting them down to six six or twenty twenty vision. Um, they don't need the best vision possible. They need functional vision, so the, the best vision that they can cope with for their daily life. Um, they may well be willing to sacrifice a little bit of vision for better comfort and better. Um, lifestyle with the contact lenses. So soft lenses can't be overlooked. And, and even with a patient that you would sit down and think this patient needs an RGP, I, I can't, I'll never fit a, con a soft contact lens on this patient. That you can often be surprised and, it, and it, it's worth trying something because you, you will never know what that patient can see out of a soft lens until you try it. The benefits of, of soft lenses is that they're usually better comfort they're easier and cheaper to replace. If somebody loses or breaks one, they tend to be easier and cheaper to replace. Um, and it can make the patient feel a bit more normal. They're not, they're not using these, um, these unusual lenses that, that none, no, none of the friends know anything about. Um, the disadvantages can be that the, ver the vision can be variable. It can um, be uh, it, uh, good one minute and poor the next. So it depends on how, how much it, that occurs and whether the patient can deal with that. Um, there can be some contrast issues and ghosting. It all depends on, on the shape of the cornea, but again, you'll have to speak to the patient and see how they feel about it. Some of the lenses can be thicker than your average if you have a, um, a, a specialist uh, soft keratoconic lens, you can have thicker um, lenses and that can mean less O2, less uh, transmissibility, which can mean that the, the patient develops other issues later, uh, down, further down the line. So that has to be monitored. Standard soft lenses can be used. You, you, your AccuView or your CooperVision lenses or CooperVision in the UK at least have a very good range of extended, wear, extended range lenses. I think we can go up to still of about 5.75 on a standard monthly disposable lens. Um, failing that, then you, you, you know, you'll need to go on to a, a more bespoke laser foot lens. You will expect more, a bit more movement post blink with a, uh, a on a keratoconic eye because these lenses aren't really fit. They're, they're, they're fitted to, or they're, they're designed for a, a, a cornea with normal parameters, normal K reading, which a keratoconic or an ectastic eye isn't. You should really have a stability of the axis alignment, it, it, the axis, uh, the, the, the um, toric alignment should be reasonably stable. It doesn't have to be exactly at 90 degrees, but as long as it's stable, you can compensate the toric part of the lens for that. You don't really want the lens to move too much on, on lateral gazes, because that will cause significant variability in the vision. Um, if the, the vision is blurred uh, post blink, uh, if, the, if the patient says, uh, if they blink and then say oh, it's gone really blurred and then it, it gets clearer again, that's often a, an indication that the lens is too tight. And conversely, if, if the VA is good straight after blink, then it can mean the lens is too loose. So these are some of the brands that we have in the UK that are specifically designed for keratoconic. Uh, corneas and our soft lenses. I use uh, the Kerasoft IC mostly, but you also got the Reflex Kera and Soflex. And then we have the Clarity XR Toric and Mark Enavoy, which are standard lenses but with, with high uh, astigmatism ranges. The lens must be stable. This is a little picture of um, a soft lens on a keratoconic eye. And as you can see, there's a bit of vertical movement but the, the axis is fairly stable it's not at 90 degrees but as long as it stays in that position then we can compensate the uh, axis on the
on the refractive part of the lens to compensate for that. This is a case study of a chap I saw a few years ago now. He's a 32 year old businessman, <clears throat> quite a successful businessman. He's been wearing RGPs for some time. Uh, it did give him a vision of 6.5, uh, but he, he really wasn't happy with them. Um, it, his intolerance was quite bad. He, he wasn't able to wear his lenses for more than four hours a day. If you think about that, it's not really quite uh, long enough, especially, especially if you've got a 12 hour working day, um, it's not really good enough. Um, these were his, his typographies. As you can see, there's some central steepening. But if you look at that, it's, it's fairly uh, regular. Um, it isn't regular, but it, it's nearly. So the first thing I did uh, was I did a, a, an eye test, a, a normal refraction, spectral refraction, and these are the, the um, results I got. And we got 6.5 vision with spectacles. So I said to him, why, why are you wearing rigid gas permeable lenses? He said, because I was told to. So the first thing we did was we gave him a pair of spectacles and off he went and he was happy. He came back, he wanted contact lenses for cosmetic reasons and we just fit him with a, a, with a standard um, Cooper Vision turret lens. He was delighted. With, uh, there, as, as you can see, the right eye is slightly reduced vision, but he was happy with that. Uh, he's still, the, the UK um, driving standard is 612. Is, is, beyond the, the driving standard, uh, and he's perfectly happy with that. We've also got hybrid lenses. Um, these are, are, are RGP lenses with a soft lens skirt sewn into the edge. These are, are, have come along a long way since the originals made by Supervision in the, you know, the 90s. Um, they're a good alternative for RGP fit, um, and the larger replaced piggyback systems uh, where you use a soft lens with an RGP lens on top. Um, they work by cushioning the RGP lens, and most of the bearing is taken by the soft lens skirt. And the advantage with these is, um, if you manage to get uh, find a, a good manufacturer of these, you can actually take somebody's current RGP lens fit, or very close to it, and just put a soft lens skirt on it. That lifts the lens a little bit higher off the cornea, is less bearing on the centre cornea, and it can often do the trick. It's quite, it's quite an easy transition. The problem with these lenses, and one of the, the reasons why I don't use these as my first line of defense is that they, they can be really difficult to get out, get out of the eye, and that can put a lot of people off. So, um, the fitting, fitting principles of these, um, we, we basically fit them very similar to an RGP fit. Uh, you fit as close to alignment as possible with 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 a feather touch on the apex of the cornea. Um, some some of the systems, particularly the Ultra Health from um, Synergize in the US, they recommend approximately a 50 micron um, fluorescine, uh, sorry, tear layer above the the apex of the cone. They come with fitting guides to tell you how to do that. Um, fairly simple method. Um, others, you can use a, a, a keratometer or a topographer to help you fit, um, but you're after this apex touch, uh, feather apex touch. So here's a, a hybrid lens on eye, and you can see that the lens is, is virtually stuck, doesn't move. And that's okay, because these lenses are quite, quite breathable. You don't want patients to be wearing them fully, but as you, as you compare that to the RGP at the start of the, of the, the lecture, the video of the RGP at the start of the lecture, you can see that this lens, lens is much more stable and that offers much better vision for the patient and also comfort. So this is a case study for a hybrid lens. This was a, a 54 year old accountant. Uh, he, he had a successful RGP fitting However, um, in one eye, but in the left eye, he'd had intacts, which is, um, if, no, if you don't know what they are, they're the little plastic rings that are inserted within the stroma of the cornea to try and flatten the cornea out to, to make it less keratoconic like, and make the astigmatism more uh, regular. But in this case, it hadn't really worked properly and the cornea was really quite steep. 
Um, he struggled with RGP fitting and comfort. Um, this was complicated by the fact that he had a uh, primary open angle glaucoma and he'd had a, a bleb operation, a little um, uh, a drainage bleb that was on the superior of his conjunctiva at the limbus. Um, all RGPs were dropping um, to that, that, that um, steepening at the inferior of the cornea. There's his topography. That was his prescription and he was seeing 612. So this is him with his RGP and it was quite a large RGP. And as you can see, it's dropping to beyond the limbus at the bottom there. It was quite mobile, so it was moving a lot when he was blinking. We were fitted to a, he was refitted to an Ultra Health, which is a, a hybrid lens. It was a minus six spherical prescription and he got 67.5. So as you can appreciate, it's a big difference. Okay. So this is another one, um, a serial civil servant, long-standing PMD patient, pollution module generation. It had multiple graphs. The eye was very thin. All previous lenses have been uncomfortable and struggled to keep the lenses in the eye. Here's the cornea. As you can see, there's a marked difference between the superior and the inferior there. Very steep at the bottom where the, the, the red is. And we had a prescription of minus 25 in the right eye with a minus 5 at 140. And we're getting 624 vision out of, of, uh, of that. Refitted to an ultra health, right eye minus 20, left eye minus 875. And we got those visions. So mini sclerals are my first line of defense with, with uh, unusually shaped corneas. And the fitting principle is that the, the lens fits or, or sits the weight bearing surfaces on the sclera or the conjunctiva past the limbus. And this is a, an image to show you that when we draw an eye, we, we often draw this image, don't we, where, where the, the cornea bulges out. Um, but actually, that's not true. If you look at a, a cornea, a, an OCT, we can see that the cornea and the, the, the sclera are virtually the same curvature at the limbus. So there's no bulging at all, really. Um, and, and that's where that becomes an advantage with these, these uh, larger RGP lenses, because we can bridge the cornea quite easily. So the way we fit these lenses is, is, is different to, to any other type of lens or the way I fit them. And rather than thinking how steep the lens is, think about how deep the lens is. So this is where looking at the profile of the cornea can be really quite, quite helpful because you can decide how, how tall or deep that lens that you're going to put on the eye needs to be. Mm -hmm. The lenses are fitted with three principles, really, you, 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 three areas. You're looking at the central uh, apex area, so you want to, to make sure the lens bridges the cornea completely, doesn't touch it. So when you insert the lens, if you insert it with fluorescein, you can see uh, if there's any, any touch. So you're looking centrally first, then you're looking at the limbal zone to make sure there's a nice fluorescein bleed all the way around the limbus, and then you're looking at the peripheral edge of the lens. So you want to make sure that the lens sits nicely on the sclera, it doesn't block off the blood vessels of the conjunctiva, and it's not fluting, it's not lifting off the conjunctiva as well. So this is a, a top topography of a keratoconic patient. You can see the, the inferior cornea is very steep there, that hot spot of, of uh, steepening. If we fit, so we fit the, the mini scleral lens onto this. This is where I was telling you before about the optic sections become really quite quite useful for you. So this is an optic section of a, a mini scleral lens on a patient's eye. You can see on the far, this, this optic section, the left-hand side, you can see the cornea. 
which in this case is a keratoconic cornea, so it's slightly thinner, maybe 450 microns. Then you've got the lens on the far right hand side. You can see the front surface is that bright white line, and there's a darker area that that's the lens. Now, the lenses I fit, I think it's typically standard. Um, rigid, mini scleral lenses are typically around about 300 microns in thickness. So there you can see you've got about 450 micron cornea, you've got a 300 micron um, contact lens, and then you've got the fluorescein thickness between that. And you can estimate that between three, 350 to 400 microns in size, now uh, in, in thickness. Now, generally speaking, the, the fitting guides will tell you that once you fit a mini scleral lens, you want about a 300 micron uh, tear layer between the lens and the cornea. And this is a really easy way of visualizing that. So this is a, an OCT uh, of a mini scleral lens on the eye. You can see there's quite a thin gap between the, the cornea and the and the, the lens there. It's possibly about 100 microns. More ideally, you want it like this. Now there will always be uh, differences in the peripheral cornea. You can see it's a lot thicker on the left hand side than on the right hand side, uh, and this is because of the shape differences of the keratoconic cornea. But centrally around about 300 microns, similar thickness to the contact lens. You don't want too much limbal clearance either, so the lens doesn't want to be too, too far away from the limbus. If you do have that, you can get this conjunctival prolapse. So you can see that the conjunctival is being sucked across the limbus at the bottom there. is isn't ideal, this, it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world either. And some of these patients, you, you really can't avoid it. Um, uh, but what, you what I tend to do if I see it is I'll monitor it and if there's problems later down the line, if we get a lot of desiccation in that area, then we'll, we'll try and adjust the lens. But in a lot of cases, it can be difficult. So case study for a mini scleral lens. We've got a 64 year old retired teacher who was wearing RGP lenses and she was managing okay. She was one of these patients that said she was actually having no problems with the vision in her eyes. She had a little bit of tolerance issues. She said they were a little bit uncomfortable. <clears throat> I think that's a, a, dif a different one. Ignore that. She, she said they were actually reasonably okay. So if you look at the, the, the topography here, you can see that that right eye particularly is very, very steep. This is a classic prescription and we're getting 624. I think these are images of, this is her rigid gas permeable contact lens uh, as she was wearing it. Now, if you look at that, that fluorescein image, that looks a fairly standard fit. It, you, you would say that that was quite a good RGP fit, actually. You can just see centrally there that there's a feather touch. You can see some staining underneath that, which we'll come to in a second, but the, the, the contact lens fitting looks fairly reasonable. You've got a bit of mid peripheral touch, the, the dark ring in sort of just near the, the edge of the lens, and then you've got uh, the edge lift right around the lens. So it's not a bad fitting, actually. But when we took the lens out of the eye, you can see how much that lens is bearing on that corneal surface. That, that's the eye without the lens in, and it almost looks as though it's still got the lens in, because the lens has is, is, is changed the shape of the cornea so much. You can also see uh, the central staining from that lens chafing on the apex of the cornea. When we take that lens out and we actually refit with a mini scleral lens a few weeks later, you can see the difference. It is much more uniform fluorescein pattern. It's much less invasive to the cornea and we're getting less desiccation and, and no uh, apex uh, irritation. So vision with these lenses, vision with her lens in, her RGP lens is 618 plus. Vision without was, wasn't much worse, 636, but with a mini scleral lens, oops, we, we're managing 67.5. So these are some of the, I just put these in because these are some of the weird cases that I, I like to put in to say, you know, unless you try something, you, you'll never know what happens. So this is a patient with, um, he'd, I think he'd had two grafts and this one had, had failed. 
well, it hadn't failed, but he'd got the this uh, blood vessel ingress with uh, calcium and lipid deposits centrally. He sat down in my chair and I thought, I'm not going to get anything out of this chap. He's not going to be able to see anything. But we gave it a go. The, pet, the, the surgeon wanted to, to find out if he could see anything before he waded in with a surgical knife. And we actually got six nine with a mini scholar lens, which I was amazed about. And and that meant that he didn't have to go under the knife for, for at least for a, a while. Um, this is a bilateral uh, this is chat with a bilateral pseudomonas patient, um, previous contact lens, soft contact lens wearer. And if you look at the picture there, you can see obviously he's got a lens in his eye, but just centrally there, over his pupil, over most of his pupil, you can see a, a hazy patch. That's the pseudomonas scar. Um, again, I didn't think I'd get much out of him. Um, he was sick 12 with glasses. Um, uh, why does it stop? Anyway, this chap was, uh, I think he, he got down to about 6'6 six, six with, a, with a mini scleral contact on. And, and that's it. So my, my take home message from this is that please always try things that you don't think will work because they, they often do and you can be surprised. Thank you very much, Drew. I found that very exciting. You give us lots of insights into complex corneas and keratoconus, regardless if you're in private practice or in hospital practice. So thank you very much. Um, wonderful use of videos and wonderful use of your corneal topographer too as well, which does add a bit more kind of, you know, genuine uh, interest to the presentation. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Laura. We have a few questions about your wonderful presentation, if that's okay. Yes, no, yeah, that's fine. Yes, thank you, Mr. Drew, for this insightful presentation. If you please can stop sharing so I can share my screen. Yes. Yeah. All right, so here we have a few questions received from the audience. So we we'll start by question one. What is the clinical difference between keratoglobus and keratoconus? Well, they're all, um, it's basically all of these conditions, the keratoglobus, keratoconus, terians, and PMD, they're all ectasias. They're basically thinning of the cornea. Um, but Keratoglobus is, is often uh, described as it's a much larger cornea. It can be called megalocornea as well. So basically the, the, the cornea is too large, it's thinned over a, a larger area. It typically have a, a horizontal, uh, sorry, a, a, an iris diameter of greater than 12 millimeters um, and you get central thinning and, and the steepening of the curvature of the, the cornea can be over a much larger area. All right. So in question two, in the management and treatment of bonus set of lens is most fair. In my particular practice, I am a big fan of the mini scleral lenses. They're, they're much more comfortable uh, than most because of their larger area. Um, but I, I don't restrict it to any particular lens. I try and pick the best lens for the patient. But I do tend to fit more mini sclerals than anything else. All right. Uh, if the patient has high reactivity to contact lens, especially in cases of low tear breakup time, what other recommendations can be employed? Well, um, that's, I think this is re really aimed more at the RGP patient because um, you don't really get reactivity with with a, a, a soft or a, well, you can, but it's rarer with a soft or a mini scleral lens. In fact, mini scleral lenses, I have, I do fit them for pe people with dry eye patients for dry eye, because you do, you, because of the principle of the lens, you, you've got a lot of the, you've got tears trapped 
between the contact lens and the cornea that can make the eye much more comfortable. Obviously, you're not going to have the front surface as wettable um, because of the, the, the patient's dry eye. So in that particular case, you can use artificial tears, preservative-free drops um, during the day, and they can help. In severe cases, um, it, it, it can be difficult, but they're rare. Oh. Okay. If the patient has binocular or accommodative anomalies and still presents with keratoconus, what will be the management plan? Right, well, that depends on the patient, really. Um, you can fit them as you would normal, a normal binocular patient and then use over spectacles to help with their binocular issues or accommodative issues. The other option would be to fit just one eye um, and uh, leave the other one to see if it can, it can they, they can suppress it. If they can't suppress it, then you can think about using a opaque iris printed lens. So basically blocking one eye, putting a patch on one eye and fitting the other eye with, with a standard you know, a lens to, to help with a keratoconus. So it depends mm -hmm. on the patient, it depends whether they, they're desperate to have two eyes working together or whether they can manage with a patched eye. Okay. And here we come to the last question from the audience. Are there known causes of keratoglobus? Um, these ectasias, we, we're still, there's still research ongoing as to why, why people develop ectasia. Um, there is a genetic link. There is genetic links. It's not a particularly strong link. Um, we know that eye rubbing um, is associated with um, ectasias, but we don't know if eye rubbing causes the ectasia or you rub your eyes because you've got the ectasia. We've no, we've no idea what the association is. So the best, the best option is to tell people, try your best not to rub your eyes because we know that that will that is associated with your eyes getting worse. Um, they may be a, they're, they're usually atopic, so that's why they rub their eyes. So they're very allergic. They usually got hay fever in it's what we call it in this country, uh, which is allergy to grasses and trees and, and all sorts of different pollens. Um, so they, they tend to rub their eyes a lot. So you can think about prescribed, we, in this country, we can prescribe drops. Um, you can maybe write to the doctor and say, can this person have allergy eye drops and um, to help ongoing to help them eyes feel more comfortable it means they don't have to rub them as much which means hopefully that the condition won't get any worse yes we have one question in the chat box uh, similar to that uh, asked before but in terms of water content which type of contact lens is most preferable in dry eyes cases also in terms of water content <clears throat> well, obviously, um, this person is talking about a soft lens um, because uh, rigid gas permeables don't have water content. Uh, but uh, you, the higher the water content, the better. With a with a with a dry eye patient, if it's a true dry eye patient, they, they're going to struggle with most soft lenses. Um, if it's a, a, a real, uh, you'd really want to be treat under treating the underlying cause of the dry eye, if that might be myobomian gland dysfunction, it might be aqueous uh, deficiency, tear production deficiency, which you might want to use uh, different lubricant drops with. You might think about using punctual plugs. I don't know whether optoms around the world can use those. We can in the UK, I fit them regularly, so they can be helpful. Um, but think about moving along to a, a hybrid or a mini scleral lens. As I said before, it's quite protective of the cornea and that can help with dry eye patients. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Jewel, for your answers. Here's your email for any further questions. You can contact him directly. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. So here I pass to work. my thank colleague, you. Mr. Loken. Thank you. So thanks for answering those questions, Drew. In the interest of time, we may not be able to answer any further questions, but if you do have any queries you'd like to address the guest speaker, please put your question in writing to the email address that was on the screen a few moments ago. Um, so thank you much for attending today. Um, your thoughts are very important to us. So we will be sending out an email with some survey questions 
and we'd very much like it if you could fill those in and complete and send it back to us. So your thoughts and opinions on these webinars are very important to us. So thank you very much. The next webinar will be in two weeks time on the 8th of May, and we're delighted to say we have the chairman of the Nigerian Optometric Association, Dr. Ozzy Okunukua, and he is gonna give us a talk on um, the making of a policy. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for attending the World of Optometry webinar, and we look forward to seeing you at the next presentation. So I'll bring this presentation to a close. Thank you and good day.